Welcome back to another episode of the Bear Trap on the Boom and Bust channel, a Bears podcast by a Bears fan. I'm your host, Terry, and tonight we are winging it. We absolutely winging it. Um, usually, I've learned over time to set these things out, kind of structure it a little bit. I'll go off structure. It, it's not very regimented, but it is a bit of a structure, so I know what points I want to hit. Write it out, figure it out, all that good stuff. There is a, a method to this, but tonight we just going off the cuff. We're going off the absolute cuff. Got a little tequila here tonight. Man, we 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 going off the cuff. We just gonna talk because there's nothing structured to talk about. The bears have no structure. And look, I said many times before I'm a fan of football, so I'm going to have a certain level of enjoyment. I love percentages, and I'll leave. I'll use percentages th- throughout this whole time. So get used to it. I would say I get a I I, I get a good sixty percent enjoyment just watching football. I mean, it, part of that is fantasy. Uh, part of that is betting, but all of it together, I just watch this football and this year I got a chance to watch a lot more football than usual so there's that I just enjoy the game um but I love my bears so the other 40 percent of my bears and it does hurt me to see us how we are but it doesn't hurt me like some people it's not everything to me I love the actual game so um there that's kind of the angle I'm coming from but anyway, we're going to talk about the Bears, and we're just going to freestyle it. So, the first thing I want to talk about, or the first, I want to bring up a story. I'm, I might have brought this story up before, but I want to bring up the story because I think it, it, it really speaks to the situation that we're going through. So, I want to talk about time, my first time as an offensive coordinator. And this is why I talk about this whole idea of a defensive-minded coach, uh, um, uh, offensive-minded coach. Uh, I'll I'll just remind you real quick my background because I think it's important for people to understand. So as far as my football background, um, I played in high school. And I I was more of an academic than a football player in terms of my mindset. Like I started, I did all that good stuff, but I I didn't think about football in terms of NFL and all that um, because I knew I was gonna go to college. I knew I was gonna get do all that stuff, and so uh, throughout some different tor- turmoil, I, I just definitely never got the chance to do what I thought I could have did. Fine, cool. And then I played rugby for four years in college, but I also coached for two years in college at high school where we went um, second round, third round of the state playoffs, all that. This was not a a school that had a long history of that, but the year I got there, we ended up like being very dominant. And that's not because of me. It was just a circumstance of what was happening. So that's why I learned. That's why I cut my teeth, as they say. And then from there, I went to a few coaching clinics. And then one of my mentor or my coach from high school that I consider a mentor, I reached out to him and told him I was coaching and all this. He gave me a lot of uh, advice. We talked. And he got me into these clinics. And so I volunteered at these Glazier clinics, which are huge for coaching. And it's not just high school. It's high school, college, NFL. So I met a lot of people as a volunteer. I met uh, people that were very big at the time in college. I met NFL uh, position coaches that were big. I met a couple coordinators. All things. I met Bill O'Brien right before he became the head coach of the Texans. So I met a lot of people. And so when I volunteered, I I was able to talk with these people because I set up the room. I got everything set and I was able to talk with them. And then if you a coach, if you coach football, you know, these clinics, how they go. Any clinic, honestly, to be honest, if I'm outside of football and life clinics is is where the money at. 
So outside of that, like, it's just a lot of drinking, partying, talking, all that socializing. So I met with a lot of different coaches throughout uh, my time, and and we were able to not only talk football, but watch film to go over their stuff, to go over their tape, to go over their handouts. A lot of football. Talked a lot of football. So when I talk about these things, I come at it from a coaching perspective. I mean, obviously, I play. A lot of people play at the high school level. But in terms of also having players that went on to the uh, high Division One level, couple players that have been drafted, couple players that's in the NFL now that I've coached or I know. So um that's just kind of my perspective so i get it might be a little biased but that's fine so anyway so talking about the first time i was an offensive coordinator i took over this team uh with a coach who's the head coach that for my coaching tree and again i talk about coaching trees and it's very true like people want to talk about nepotism and all that i got a lot of stories so i took over this uh team this uh, coach that I trusted, I believed in, he, he took over a, a team that wasn't great, and he was the head coach. He brought me in as the offensive coordinator. He is a defensive coordinator by trade, and he I'm a D lineman coach by trade, technically, even though I've taught all over. So he asked me to come in, offense coordinator. I pitched on my ideas and all that. So I had this system. I had this idea of what I wanted to do. Now, coming in to high school, I've said before, I never really got into the details, but high school is harder than any coaching job. So I get to this job. Not only are players not there every day, but my quarterback is also starting on defense. He's a great athlete. That's what happens in um, the high school ranks. And then my other quarterback option, he never played quarterback before. Again, big, physical, great athlete, but just never played quarterback before. So I have this whole system that I developed that the head coach wants to do. And I'm trying to teach it. But I'm also not teaching just the quarterbacks. I'm coaching I'm coaching the running backs. And I'm also uh, coaching the offensive line, or at least half of them. And we just did not have the resources to do this. So needless to say, we get into the games, and the offense looks shaky, I will say. Because we have some great athletes. And that's, that's honestly... Uh, a big part of me not calling people bust and all this stuff is because I coach. You have some amazing players that just never got the chance to show what they had. So we had some amazing players. We had big plays here and there, but we were never the team we were supposed to be. And then, you know, things kind of fell apart. But all that to say is when things kind of fall apart, obviously... It's not just the fans. It's not just the media. The coaches say, okay, what can we do to fix this? We're looking at it. What's wrong with this? How can we adjust it? And there's so much that goes into it. You got to teach formations. You got to teach motions. You got to teach, you know, audibles. You got to teach, obviously, how to actually execute the blocking scheme, how to execute the route tree, how to act execute the pass protection it's so much and so again we're talking about um high school with not a lot of resources and not a lot of time when you're in high school and college it's not a lot of time now in the nfl things have changed like if you would have looked back in the day i would have said we were at a 10 percent in terms of you know um just overall efficiency, availability, resources, all that. And they were at 100%. But now, I would say we're at a 10% still, maybe a 15, and they're at a 65. Because they do not have the amount of time in practice. They do not have the number of practices. There's a lot of things they can't do. There's no contact periods, much like college. The NFL has changed a lot. And so when you talk about 
being able to be with your quarterback. Like, if that's all I could do, there's so much more we could have got done. But I had so much other things to worry about in the coach. And obviously, you get to the NFL, you're not worried. You're not coaching every position. But as an offense coordinator, you are, you know, trying to put everything together. So when you're talking about putting a quarterback in the system, a new system, and then you talk about pivoting from that to a new system, yes, the NFL has a lot of time, a lot more resources, but it is very hard to do. There is so much stuff that has to go into it. I don't think people really understand. So I segue that into our conversation about the Bears and everything. And we talk about Justin Fields. Everybody wants to talk about Justin Fields. And again, I I try to understand the better Bears fans, the better football fans of this group that subscribe, that listen and comment, all that. But I see a lot of stuff and it's, it's sometimes hard to separate it. But a lot of people want it one way or the other. That's society in general. That's definitely football. It is not it's not the smart thing to do at the end of the day, because if you truly I, I've never, in my opinion, met a coach that coached at a serious level that hit me up and said, what you're saying is completely all for what you're saying is not true. Um, coaches get wrapped up in the moments, even NFL coaches. There's a lot of that, but I think most coaches realize that if you get in a film room and you look over the film, it is never, ever zero percent one person. There's somebody that didn't block right. There's somebody that didn't run a route at the right time, and the quarterback didn't see something. The linebackers didn't feel quick enough. The D-line didn't get off the block. There's so many things to critique. And you got players, which we know, if you're a football fan, you know there's players that talk about all this constant criticism and they hate it. And they're not looking to grow. They're not looking for people to criticize them. And then there's other players that you've seen and heard that really embrace it and they really want to get better and they'll take the criticism. And so that's a whole different conversation. But the point is, there's always something to talk about. Like people do not get it. I talk about the film we do, man. There might be nine, 10, 11 plays. It takes an hour. What do you think a whole film session takes? Especially like if it was a bad game and we really want to harp on it, we could be there for four hours. If we want to get them out quick, it might be two hours. But film takes a lot of time because there's a lot of people on the field doing a lot of different things. And so when I come at it from that perspective, I just don't empathize with a lot of fans that go to the deep end or go crazy over what's happening because we're not at practice. We don't know what's being taught. We don't know what's being emphasized. There's a lot going on that we just don't know. All right. So even with that being said, again, talking about the offense and Justin Fields and what to do to fix it, I don't know that there's a lot to do to fix it. And that's the ugly truth of it. That's the ugly truth that nobody really wants to talk about. Um, Because, as I said, imagine me, again, trying to do what I did in the summer where not everybody's there, including the quarterback, and not everybody's actually locked in, and I'm trying to coach multiple positions. You get to the NFL, it's a lot easier than that. But still, just imagine if that player is not looking at film in their off time when they're at home. Imagine if that player is not understanding things and not asking questions, but just nodding along. All these different things play into that. And so as I talk about a lot in my draft, who the player is matters a lot. And I'm not trying to say anything 
terrible about Justin Fields as a person because I don't know him. But as a football player, I watch him and I, I feel like he did not work on a lot. I honestly don't think he worked on a lot. From watching him over the last two years and what's going on and even how he's responding, I just feel like he's a player that wants to do what he feels quote unquote comfortable with because he felt comfortable in the pocket in college, but now he wants to run. But he feels comfortable with what has worked in the NFL, and that's him running. So I feel like I see a player that just wants to stick to that and doesn't want to get exponentially better. And I'm going to be wrong. He might do a lot of different things, but I know it's extreme work to change your muscle memory. And we've seen players do it, and it's not easy. So I don't know what Justin Fields did, but on the field – when he plays quarterback, that's what it looks like to me. And so then we go to the coaches. Again, I talked about my bias as a coach, but at the end of the day, I talked about it. I, I hear so uh, sports media, and if you really listen to me, you know that's why I started this channel because I hate sports media. So I hear sports media and other people talk about Robert Sala is not a good defensive coach because the defense didn't play well. Now, do you really think somebody that came from years with the best defense? Because let's throw this out the window. Let's throw it out the window right now. Matt Eberflus came from a defense of unit that played highly. You had Robert Sala come from a defensive unit that played highly, and we can go down the line from every head coach and I talk about it when the Black Friday comes and head coaches change it's stupid it's a bad system a hundred percent agree because people are picking head coaches off what they did as coordinators that is not the same job as a head coach and so even with that being said though when you pick we all acknowledge when you pick a head coach it is because what they did as a coordinator unless they was a previous head coach. So to sit here and say Matt um sorry, not Matt. Or we go there. To say Matt Patricia can't coach defense. Or to say Robert Sala can't coach defense. Or to say Matt Nagy can't coach offense or Luke Getty and, and the people that we want to talk about. To say that they got here and we're like, oh actually they suck at it. Is that really true? And I'm not saying definitive yes or no, but logically, and I put this in the community, do we want to think about that and say, does that make sense? Is that true? They got here and all of a sudden they don't know how to coach what, the, what got them a head coaching job. Now, do I think that makes them a good head coach? No, but that's what the media does. Oh, Iberflus is a defensive-minded head coach. So the defense sucks. What's going on? Robert Sala is a defensive-minded head coach. Defense sucks. He must not hold a coach defense. That's not how it goes. There is no, oh, you want the mastermind or nothing. Like, like there is a lot that happens, as I said before. You could be a coordinator and the head coach does a lot of the work. So I'm not saying that's not true. But there's no way that you just absolutely don't know what you're doing and you still have a top unit. There's no way. I don't care about nepotism. I don't care about nothing. I do not believe in my experience that a coach can know absolutely nothing and be covered up by some other coach, especially in 2023 where you have such a microphone, you have such a platform that if that was the truth, if that was the truth where Luke Gatsy knew nothing about offense, he was just standing there. I'm happy to be here. The coaches hired me because they knew me and, and, um, Matt LaFleur was the actual genius. And, and I hate using that word genius, to be honest, because it overhyped, and that's the reason people try to take people down. But Matt LaFleur was the actual architect. There's no way I believe that would not come out. There's no way I believe that would not come out. 
So personally, I don't believe in that narrative that people just do that. And again, I feel like people that say that, and I might have been a little facetious in the community, but I feel like people that believe that you you just haven't been around football long enough. If you coach, you know it does not go like that. It does not even the idea flow doesn't go like that, but also the breaks don't go like that. I mean, it's hardcore everywhere you go. So I I, I personally just don't believe that Matt Nagy got here and had no idea how to run offense or Luke Getzey. I don't. What I believe happens is what happened with me is you realize the quarterback is limited. And the quarterback can't execute the things you want to do. So what happened with me, and I'm going to just use me, I started to scale back a lot of things I want to do. There's a lot of pre-snap things I want to do. There's a lot of nuances to the game that a lot of fans don't knew, realize. And and so I wanted to do a lot of that, but because I didn't have a quarterback, I had to scale it back. Be in the same way that people say, okay, we need to play action roll out 30 times a game. We need to do movement, whatever. They think that's the answer. Everybody's in the answer right now mode. The, the truth is, as I said before, the Bears are not going to get fixed with one move or three moves. It's not going to happen. It's not basketball. We have wasted all the free time we have to coach and to just learn freely. We are now in the season. You fire Getty, you bring somebody in. They're not going to magically change everything and implement a new system that emphasizes Justin Fields' strengths. No, it's not going to happen. We went. Uh, halfway through the season and we changed it up last year and people say it worked did we win? I don't think we did and I saw the Colts I'll say this too I saw the Colts doing their practice with the Bears they were running like triple wing option stuff with Anthony Richardson and I'm not saying that's what they're going to go to because they already tried him even though he got you know hurt they tried them and they might think of, you know, some other things to do, but that's what they thought of them at first. Let's run triple wing option in the NFL because we want to dumb it down as much as we can to get the quarterback confident. And confidence is key. Confidence is big. But at the same time, what does that mean in the long term? I told you. It doesn't work. It's a game of space and time. You cannot run triple wing option and all this other gimmick stuff and win games for the long term consistently. The best teams that win are the teams that win in different ways. We talk about a lot with the Patriots and Tom Brady. They can win a close game at the kick, uh, you know, for three. They can win blowing you out. They can win in a shootout. They can win in, you know, one turnover game. Matt, they can do a lot of things. That's what most champions do. They win in different ways. You look at teams like Baltimore, and again, not hating on Lamar none, but it's the truth because that's the team we emulated. They only won one way, front running, just like the Ravens that won back in the day. Now, some people say you can't win that way these days because the NFL has changed. I'm not going to say that, but I will say if you are a team that can only win one way, it's going to be hard because there's going to be games and matchups because who you play matters. The matchups will change what the game is. And you no longer have a 14-point lead on offense. Or you no longer get to pass rush four people on defense. You got to start changing things up. Can you still win? And so that's the thing that I think separates a lot of people. And, you know, again, looking forward, 
we talked about this. I guess I should have mentioned it up front. We talked about this. The Bears is simple. A lot of people won't got questions and want to know what. It's simple. The defense does not generate pass rush. We got one sack. That's just pure sacks. I would venture to say our pressure rate isn't great if I believe in numbers like that. We don't generate a lot of pressure. So what that equals to a lot of time to pass, a lot of big times to play the ball. The other thing I said is that we are an aggressive front. We get up field, which I don't think is a negative, but we get up field. The Packers did a great job, and teams since then have been a great job of exploiting that. Misdirection, stuff to the perimeter, screens, delays. Let us get up field, take advantage of our aggression, and play it against us. Do I think we're an above average group against the run? Yes, I do. Fully healthy against the pass, I think we're an average group. But when we have teams take away our aggression and use it against us, there's only two things. You get burnt or you start hesitating. Either way, you got big play opportunities. Because you look at the numbers, it's not great, but overall we're middle of the field with first down efficiency. But the thing is, people get big plays on us, and that's the stuff that kills us. Especially when you add it into the fact that the offense doesn't stay on the field. We don't get a lot of first downs. We don't have a lot of time possession. And so the defense is on the field constantly. And if not constant, only constantly, they're also on the field with short field position. There's not a lot they can do. So that's the Bears. I mean, that's the defense offensively. We don't have the pass protection to allow Justin Fields to wait to see it open. He does not have the ability to see it before it's open and throw it. We don't have that. And so those two mix together to be a bad combination because if the defense is giving up first downs and the defense is allowing people to make big plays, the offense has to chase those points. It's simple. That's all it is. I mean, there's books on it that I've read, but overall, there's four or five different strategies, big time strategies and philosophies to a game. The the, the Bears in the NFL strategy is to limit on defense and run the ball, misdirection, make big plays off play action. That's how we set up. But we don't have the the personnel and we don't have the coaching to, to execute it. So it's simple. People don't want to hear it, but it's simple. And it's been simple for a long time. But that's kind of where we are. And I talked about all these different things. But all that to say is what I've been saying for a long time. The blame is on everybody. The blame is on the play calling and the philosophy. The blame is on Justin Fields not getting better, not making plays. The blame is on the offensive line. The blame, I, w- I would say the, the only where the blame isn't is the run game. That's not being utilized by Getty, but that doesn't mean they're not doing their job. So, anyway, there's a lot to talk about. There's even more that I could talk about. Uh, we need to talk about the future of the Bears. But go down in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Share around. Get the conversation started. Thumbs up. Subscribe. And remember, stay up and bear down.